Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another Victober video. And I have a really special interview for you today. I am delighted to be joined by Clemens Schultz and Julia Courtney, who I found through Charlotte Mary Young Connections. Uh, so I guess, Julia, would you like to uh, kind of, what? how did you come to the Charlotte Mary Young Fellowship? Well, I came um, very shortly after the fellowship was founded, which was early in the 1990s, because I was then I just completed a PhD um, based on um, Charlotte Young. And uh, when I found out about the fellowship, I obviously wanted to join because this is part of my academic life and part of my interests. So that's how I found the fellowship. Oh, lovely. And then Clements, how did you uh, become a part of it? Well, I became a member at about the same time, I think, as, as, as Julia, um, because the fellowship actually arose out of the Barbara Pym Society, which I'd long been a member of. <clears throat> and some people at the Barbara Pym Society said Charlotte Young ought to have uh, a, 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 an organization like this, and they founded it. Uh, mm -hmm. And was I was a very early member, and since I've, well, that was 1995, I think. And mm -hmm. Since then, I was for a time, I was the chairperson uh, and uh, Julia and I still edit the journal, don't we, Julia? Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah, we do. Wow. And I have, I think I've heard that Barbara Pym was a fan of Charlotte Mary Young. That's quite Indeed, right. She was. she was. She was. Yes. Oh. Some of her, I mean, Will Match in A Glass of Blessings is named after a Charlotte Young character. And there's a lot of oh. links between Pym and Young. Um, in uh, A Few Green Leaves, the heroine's mother is an expert on Charlotte Young. Wow. Oh, that makes me like Barbara Pym even more. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> kind of any friend of Charlotte Mary Young is, is a friend of mine. Um, so then just uh, kind of Harkening back to the beginning of your interactions with Victorian literature, I would love to hear about how you both became familiar with it. I'm assuming, since you are British, that it was assigned in school, possibly. So I guess, yeah. Julia, how did you how did you come to know about it? Well, uh, yeah, it was it was in school. Um, I have to say that um, my first uh, uh, traumatic introduction to Victorian literature when I was around seven years old, and I was absolutely terrified by a radio adaptation of A Christmas Carol. However, this did mm -hmm. not put me off for life because then in school we had the mayor of Casterbridge. At that time, I didn't really take to Thomas Hardy. I think I was too young, although now he's probably my... I mean, he, he's certainly one of my top authors. Mm -hmm. um, so and then when I was in sixth form, um, I well, so I would about been about 17. Um, I started reading Trollope and I read Barchester Towers and I mm -hmm. just fell in love with Barchester Towers. It was so funny. It was a bit like the place I lived because I was brought up in Winchester, which, of course, Charlotte Mary Young knew very well. She came from a village out of Porn, just outside Winchester. She visited Winchester a lot. She knew the family of the headmaster of Winchester College, which is a, a, a big British public school. And uh, so uh, Barchester Towers, I mean, Trollope's Barsetshire is really sort of based on Hampshire and Wiltshire. So it's very much, you know, where I lived. But it was obviously, um, you know, removed because it was in the 19th century. But it was just so funny. And I just fell in love with, with Trollope. He really, he uh, is just very approachable in his writing and how he addresses the reader and does all these asides. Uh, his, his books are quite engaging and uh, yeah. yeah, it just, he's he's way up there for me as well. Good, good. And then Clements, how about you? Well, I was brought up in a Victorian house with a lot of Victorian books in it, though they mostly weren't novels, in fact, but mm -hmm. one mother's favorite books uh, was a long forgotten bestseller of 1875 uh, by Helen Mathers, that's a pen name, uh, called Coming Through the Rye. And it's an absolute wow. It's absolutely <laughs> wonderful. And I still think it ought to be, it ought to be revived. Uh, wow. and, um, it's, uh, it's partly autobiographical or parts of it are, are, are based on the um, Ellen Buckingham Matthews was the woman's real name. Uh, and it was bestseller in its day, made her name. Uh, and for example, um, you know, people used to have um, 
albums of um, best likes, you know, favorite, favorite color, favorite flower mm. or mm. character. The, um, the anti-hero in that book, the heroine's uh, tyrannical father, was you know, a friend of mine who had owned one of these um, uh, contemporary albums. The governor was one of people's favorite characters very often. And it's a it's a rattling good yarn and full of romance and things. Anyway, this had me hooked on Victoriana. Um, and then I went on, we we had a bowdlerized David Copperfield at school and things didn't really take to that. Um, but like Julia, Trollope, um, the warden and Barchester Towers in 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 particular. Oh, thank you. And I, I wrote those two titles down because I'm always interested in finding more under the radar Victorian literature kind of hidden gems. Um, it's fun to, to branch out. Um, so then I guess you both answered this a little bit. I was going to, going to ask the first Victorian novel that you loved. So Julia, would you say that it was Barchester Towers? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I kind of struggled with Barchester Towers, but I liked it enough to continue and then really fell in love with Dr. Thorne. Um, mm. And I mean, the whole series though, as a whole, now that yeah. I finished it, I would love to just go back and read through it all again. And then Clemens, so some of those titles you listed, you would say those yes. are the ones that kind of- Definitely coming through the right. Yeah. And the Alice books, before, before that, the Alice books. I oh. was very fond of those indeed. Yes, read them again. Yes. So then looking at Victorian literature as a whole, which it's not a genre, you know, there's many different categories mm. that are in it. What do you think um, is so, uh, keeps it fresh feeling, even though it's old, but you feel like you can learn new things from it and it feels vibrant and maybe what keeps drawing you back to it? I guess, Clements, would you, do you have any, any uh, insight about this? Well, I'm I'm very much not a specialist, you see, in in this, and I've never I've never taught it because I'm a Roman historian, um, so I am a complete hobbyist in 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 this respect. Um, what takes me back, I suppose, is being a historian. I like to look at um, history th sometimes through novels, but contem contemporary written ones. I mean, um, though though I. I do sometimes uh, read and enjoy modern written uh, historical novels, but there's there's nothing like seeing an era through the books that the people living then were writing and obviously reading. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the attraction of Young for me, but it's also uh, part of the interest in 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 Trollope and even in Dickens, who is you know in no way a, a, a realistic novel. I nevertheless enjoy and go back to one or two Dickens leaving the others on one side, but I go back to one or two uh, again and again because uh, uh, of, of, their, of their qualities. Um, that's, that's the main thing, I think, that uh, you, you get a feel for the, well, I suppose the, the intellectual ethos of the period through reading the novels. Yeah, you definitely do. And it's really, uh, it kind of challenges maybe some stereotypes that you might have and uh, gives you a broader and kind of more nuanced view of the era. One random little tidbit. Uh, I was wondering if either of you knew. I just read The Stokesley Secret. So that was yeah. a new Charlotte Mary Young for me. And I was completely charmed by it. It's funny because the title I thought wow, she's going to write a sensation novel. <laughs> but it's very par for the course for her. But just a random little tidbit, it talks about them being out in the garden and using the garden, I think they called it a garden machine to water the plants. So is that, would that be a Victorian term for a garden hose? Mm, I think so. Okay. Yeah. 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 It was probably pumped. You probably filled, I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect... <laughs> the vessel and and pumped it out I think yeah very yeah. likely yeah, yeah okay um and then Julia for you what is it about Victorian literature that seems special and unique compared to literature from other eras well I think Clements has put it you know better than I ever could because um I was trained as a historian um and 
when I, I spent a lot of time working on and researching and teaching 19th century British history, also a bit of French and Russian, but mainly British history. And I mean, the thing is that we speak of Victorian literature, but as you said, Kate, I mean, that goes from 1837 to 1901. So basically um, what was going on in the late thirties is so different from what's going on in the nineties. So it's, um, you know, when you speak of Victorian literature, as you indicated, you need to pinpoint what bit of it you're actually thinking about. But if you want to try and orient yourself, as Clements has said, in a particular decade or in a particular mindset or within a particular group of people, then actually reading what they wrote brings you very close to them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so then, Julia, with the students that you've taught, is there a certain kind of things that are there certain kinds of things that they typically like about Victorian literature mm -hmm. and are, are surprised by and certain things that they commonly dislike? Well, uh, I have to say that the, the problem when you're teaching it, um, you're teaching it as part of a course, obviously, and the problem can be the sheer length of a lot of Victorian novels. I mean, they're thick novels, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And the students have to fit that into the whole um, sort of kind of like structure of the course. They're, they've got to write an essay on it. So they've got to read it by a certain time. They've got to read the criticism of it to integrate that into their essay. So I think the sheer daunting length of um, some of the novels, really, I mean, that's just, you know, sort of very practical, but that that can be a problem when you're teaching a Victorian novel that, you know, the students do struggle to actually get through it in time. Um, I think uh, apart from that, no, I don't think students, I mean, certainly the students that I taught who are not perhaps the average 18 year olds because I taught in the Open University. So we had a much wider age range and also people had opted to study that particular module. So they mm. wanted to study 19th century literature, which included some Victorian blockbusters. I mean, Middlemarch to name but a few. Um, but having having got into those, I mean, they really, I mean, I remember one, um, one student said, oh, Jane Eyre, what a page turner. But oh. having got into it, he was totally, drawn in into what was happening. And I mean, Middlemarch was, um, you know, was a success once they got into it. And I think they needed very much, certainly I think with teaching the 19th century novel, whatever country its origin, you do need to make sure that the students have some kind of chronology within which to orient it. Mm -hmm. Because um, for instance, the edition of Middlemarch that we used had quite a, quite a lengthy chronology tying Middlemarch, um, not only the, um, the 70s when, well, 1870 when George Eliot was writing it, but also the period in which it is set, which is set about 40 years earlier. So you've got a chronology which actually encompassed both of those date scales. And I think the students found that incredibly helpful. I know when I was teaching a couple of French novels, um, certainly for, and I, I would imagine this would be the same of whatever age the students were, as British students, they really had no idea of French 19th century history. So you actually had to get a chronology yeah, I mean, I had to make my own, but you had to actually make sure that they had some sort of framework within which to orient that particular novel, which isn't necessarily there by the time the student comes to it. Yeah, because uh, that, that's a really good uh, thing to think about. I, I'm thinking, you know, the reform bill in Middlemarch. Mm -hmm, that's right, yeah. Being yeah. part of the plot. And that's something uh, that, you know, in American schools we weren't taught about. Um, well, absolutely. Sure. And a lot of British schools, they wouldn't be either, really, or just given the date. They just get, oh, OK, 1832, fine, move on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, what's funny, though, is then uh, I just recently read Phineas Finn. And is it the, the same reform bill that is featured in that one? Or were there multiple reform bills? There were three. Um, there okay. was the 1832 one that you're referring to, then there was one in 1867, and there was one in, I think, 1882 or three. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting to think about, you said the one student who, um, he said, oh, what a page turner about Jane Eyre. And I think people are surprised. Uh, Victorian novels to me are very straightforward with, they wanna tell you an interesting story. 
Um, and they want, uh, often they'll have a linear narrative. Sometimes they hop around, but it's not, there's no kind of experimental. I, I'm more intimidated by kind of William Faulkner than I am mm -hmm. Victorian literature. I think if you get used to the different way of speaking, um, it's pretty easy to find your footing once you kind of get acclimated. I think students kind of, well, certainly the students that um, I, I recall, uh, they kind of like the fact that in many Victorian novels, you get everything tied up at the end. You know more or less what happens. I mean, that's a huge generalization. But I mean, one of the obviously characteristics of modernism is the open ending. And a lot of students don't actually like an open ending. They quite like, I mean, mine did anyway, um, they quite like to actually know pretty well what happened to people at the end. Yes, yes, as do I. <laughs> um, so then moving on to Charlotte Mary Young, um, it, it, you know, I, I don't know anyone in my personal, that way, I take that back. There is one friend that uh, this spring, I lent the heir of Redcliffe to her and she said, she, she gave it back, she read it, she loved it. And she said, as I was reading, I thought this story seems familiar. And, uh, and, and I was thinking, well, you're probably rereading it because it feels very distinct compared to other authors. And then she said, by the time she got to the end, she thought, yes, I, I had read this, but she thoroughly enjoyed the reread. But um, that's kind of the one person that I know that that has read uh, Charlotte Mary Young in my in my personal life. So I'm really looking forward to hearing kind of how you came to know about her writing. And obviously, you really got on with it because you're part of the fellowship. Uh, so Clements, how did you find Charlotte Mary Young's books? Well, the first one I came across was buying a copy of The Daisy Chain uh, mm -hmm. at a, a jumble sale, um, <clears throat> which I don't know if you have them in, in the States, but they don't even exist in the UK anymore because now we have charity shops. But those were the sales that churches or organizations would do. to, to They're raise in Barbara Penn. Sorry. And they're definitely, <laughs> yeah, Barbara they Pym. they're definitely Barbara Pym, yes. Uh, and I bought um, an early 20th century copy of the Daisy Chain with colored illustrations uh, mm -hmm. and really very engaging. But it was quite some time before that was in my teens. It was a little while before I sort of got thoroughly into her. And uh, by that time I was living in Ireland and there was a wonderful bookshop in Dublin where I gathered up, I was already on the hunt and it was before the internet or anything and before looking for books online. I gathered up oh, half a dozen or more um, copies of CMY at this marvelous secondhand bookshop. Uh, so by my twenties or that would have been or so, I was, you know, I was well, I was well into her. Um, and the Daisy Chain still remains one of my, one of my favorites. Oh. Uh, it really does. So it's, it's, and it's many people's favorite, I think. The marvelous heroine Ethel, um, uh, gawky, short-sighted, rather rather clumsy, and as clever as her brother. But of course, mm. brother, not going to school and not getting trained for anything. But she keeps up with all his schoolwork uh, yes. you know, until until he goes to Oxford, uh, and um, she is really a, a, a heroine for all the girls who were who were bookworms and you know um, top of the class and, and things and felt you know that was were made to feel a bit of a misfit because of that um so I think you know Ethel definitely remains one of my one of my favorite heroines mm. and so at Charlotte Mary Young she's not kind of one of the more fashionable Victorian authors you found them at a jumble sale you hadn't Kind of heard about her in school or that's no, interesting. No, absolutely not. No, no. I'm sure you know in no school would she would she have been taught. In more old fashioned schools that had old long standing libraries, I bet there'd have been almost unread copies of, of CMY on the on the bookshelves. I don't remember that in my my own school. Mm. Uh, so then Julia, how did you find out about her literature? Well, growing up in Winchester, um, I knew her name because there was a little display in the City Museum devoted to her. Um, so I kind of knew the name, but I'm afraid I came to her in really a very rather a practical way because I was um, casting around for a, a subject for a PhD. 
and uh, a great friend um, who in fact had been my history teacher at school, but whom I had kept in touch with, you know, through life. Um, she said she was a great reader of Charlotte Young. And mm -hmm. uh, so she suggested Charlotte Young as a possible PhD subject and lent me some of the books. And once I had read The Air of Redcliffe, um, I thought, yes, you know, I could definitely, I can, I can run with this. This is something that I'm interested in. Um, and I was sort of very much drawn into it. As finding the books, you're quite right. I don't think anything was in print um, mm. or not much at that time. At that time, I started my PhD when the youngest of my four children was two. And so we used to, as he grew up, uh, to be three and four years old, we would haunt bookshops wherever we went. We would go into secondhand bookshops. And you know that in you know the fiction section is always arranged so that you've got A at the top left hand corner and X, Y, Z down at the bottom right hand corner. And he would just run straight to the bottom right hand <laughs> corner because he knew that, that was where his mother was going to focus <laughs> as we got to, as we got to the shop. <laughs> That is so sweet. Oh, it was sweet. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love that. It was a bit of bookish serendipity then that you would, would find her. Totally, her totally. Absolute serendipity. Yeah. Yes. Complete. Complete uh, chance, the, really. the kind of selling point I try to give people is if they enjoy Louisa May Alcott's Little Women, I think mm. they will enjoy um, Charlotte Young. I There is just this uh, really special, sentimental and warm feeling about the books that feels similar to um, Little Women to me. But then when I branched out to Louisa May Alcott's other books, they all were uh, more on the didactic side. And so then finding Charlotte Young, yes, this is what I was looking for. It's been very exciting to explore her, her catalog. Um, so then what do you think it is that is so special about her books um, that just makes them uh, so inviting to, to continue to come back to and, and explore new ones, I guess, Clements, what do you think? Well, the characters are so well individualized and that comes through, particularly through the dialogue where you really cannot mistake who is, who is speaking. Mm. Um, they speak um, uh, very conversationally and engagingly about a variety of topics. I mean, about the things they're doing, but also about books and ideas and and you know, various experiences that 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 they're having. They don't, uh, in a conversational way, they don't run on with vast, long, you know, preachy, uh, uh, didactic um, passages about you know what whatever the mm -hmm. what whatever the uh, burning interest is, they seem really interested and really engaged in a, mm. in a, um, well, a, a very, that a very naturalistic, a very lifelike way. And of course, Young made a practice uh, when she was, when she was in her teens of recording as far as she could family conversations. She'd go up to her bedroom afterwards and write down what had been the, the conversation, like, like a play. You know, X said this, Y said that, you know, writing it down as far as she could remember it. And this must have given her terrific practice for making a conversation seem, you know, realistic and vivid. That is something that is really remarkable about her books to me. And I really, that is a neat kind of little in, insight to have now, because I thought it, that that's how families talk. You know, you mm. kind of jump in right after somebody else's yeah. or jump in mid sentence. Mm. Um, the conversations do feel so authentic and just alive. Um, and then Julia, what, is there anything you'd like to add regarding kind of what is special and unique mm. about her writing? I'd kind of like to add something about Alcott and Young, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, of course, Alcott was a young reader, as you know, because that's what Joe was reading and crying over the air of Redcliffe. Yeah. And if there's a huge crossover between Little Women and um, the air, because just as Guy comes into the Edmonston household, so Laurie comes into the March one. Wow. So it's a very rather isolated young man who comes into a warm family. And then there's, um, you know, the idea about uh, 
um, the rivalry between the girls in the family. So I think there's a lot of crossovers there. And one of the things that's interesting too is that um, throughout the era of Redcliffe, they're all reading um, uh, De La Mouk Fouquet's Syndrome, which was another Alcott favourite, and Jo wanted to buy a copy, didn't she? And in oh. Syndrome, one of the things that happens is that there's a problem where somebody doesn't actually do up somebody else's ice skates, which of course is what happens in yeah. Little Women, isn't it? So there's a lot of sort of crossovers there between those two books, which is interesting. Mm. Um, yes, I totally agree with what you've both said about the conversations. I think that's really a big aspect of Young. And I think uh, she's, I think one of the things that strikes one about here is that she's actually a lot cleverer than you think. She's a oh. lot cleverer than she looks, isn't she? Like the fact that yeah. she never gives you a very, very detailed description of how somebody looks, but she just gives you those little details like what they're wearing, like the hat that they're wearing, for instance, or just, um, you know, a, a, and just something about a room that she won't give you a real blow by blow description description of it but just enough to make you realize and be able to visualize yourself what the scene is and what person looks like but the cat the conversations as you both said are you know outstanding I like that she doesn't overly describe kind of the minutia of the days mm. but the what the details that she does give I love those those small details and I I was so charmed by in um the Stokesley secret how it talks about Oh, the brother who wants to be in the Navy, Sam, Sam, Sam. Sam. and he's, he, uh, he passes, there's a sort of exam he has to take mm. or, and, um, and so the kids at home make flags and, and they go out in a field and they celebrate, um, you know, they're not with him in person, but just a little detail like that. It's such a vivid picture in the reader's mind of what life is like for this family in their kind of corner of the world. Um, so then a favorite Charlotte Young book. This is like choosing a favorite child. So well, a, few, <laughs> a few favorites. Well, everyone, everyone, I think, uh, likes The Daisy Chain and The Air to a great degree. Um, uh, those, I think, if one were to canvas, don't you think, Julia, the fellowships? Yeah, them? I think so, those which we have asked top, around, haven't we? Top yeah. choices, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Isa, well, but high up, as almost as high as them, comes her longest novel. Um, the two great volumes, all the... All yeah, the absolutely. Here's a, here's, a, here's a typical volume, that's the day. Yeah. <laughs> pillars occupy... The pillars. <laughs> Of Absolutely. these Macmillan versions, mm. volumes, and um, uh, so twice as long as all the rest, <laughs> and with an enormous family of 13 children, all wonderfully differentiated, uh, who go from poverty uh, to, um, you know, re really comfortable uh, e economic circumstances. So you've got that, not quite rags to riches, but you've got that contrast, and there are a lot of struggles in the in the emerging from you know comparative poverty stage uh, to as I say to comfort and and um, very pleasant surroundings uh, and of course given that the, the the babies are just born the two numbers twelve and thirteen are just born at the beginning of the book uh, and when the hero is sixteen years old and he's about forty is he Julia when he dies something yeah like that. it's in his forties about yeah. about twenty five years mm, or, or mm. so and of course they change they develop. Uh, mm. They they go. Um, some of them uh, some of them go forever. Um, the the wastrel of the family uh, <laughs> to the states and is, is killed by <laughs> uh, and Native Americans. I'm sorry, I should have said. Um, uh, and others travel to the other side of the world. Uh, lots and lots happens, but you're constantly engaged by it. And going back to what was said about what you said, um, Kate, about the the um, you know the, the family atmosphere and time. I'd like to just sort of um, draw attention to this as one of Young's strengths. Obviously, especially in the years of poverty, there were boring days upon boring days where they just had. Yes. 
tasks, run the household, um, you know, go and buy the food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Young gives us just one of those day one in some detail through the eyes of um, a, 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 a disabled character, Geraldine, who has to live at home because she's got a lame foot and couldn't possibly uh, go, go out to work. And we see the day through her eyes, helping get the children up, uh, washing up, doing some lessons with the, with, the, with the children, doing mending from the never ending basket of mending that was always, always there. Um, the, the awful lunch where the boys come home from school midday and, and play with the food, which absolutely sickens her. And we, we realize that, of course, that day is just was just one of hundreds of days. That's what for several years life was, you know, mm. life for them. But it's so well done. You enjoy, don't you, Julia, the description of yeah. that. Mm. Even though you realize yeah. that to live through it, you, know, you couldn't describe it more than once, you know. No, no. It doesn't, but, but it yeah. gives it to us to convey, you know, their life really was reasonably grim, reasonably ordinary, not many treats, hardly any treats at all. So when the treats come and we get the descriptions of those, they they stand out and one, one realizes what it was to these children's lives. Some, I just heard uh, another rave review of the Pillars of the House, and now it's become a goal of mine to, to mm. read it. And um, I'm really grateful for Project Gutenberg um, oh, yes. with accessing her books, because how you said copies are few and far between, and that's in the 90s that you were looking for them. And here we are, I'm yeah. sure mm. they're yeah. so much harder um, to happen upon. So I'm really grateful, um, if not the same, you know, as holding a older physical book in your hands, but I would rather do that than not have access to her books. Mm -hmm. yes, um, it's a in Project Gutenberg, yes. Yes, it's amazing. Um, so then Julia, are, were your kind of top favorites listed in there? They were indeed. I mean, obviously you can't beat pillars and Clements has told us, you know, so beautifully. Uh, about the, the qualities of that amazing novel. Um, I actually enjoyed The Air. Um, the Daisy Chain has to be a favourite. I also really like The Stokesley Secret because, I, um, well, for all the reasons that you like it, and also because it's got just about one of the best opening nines in fiction. How can a pig pay the rent? Yes. I mean, what is a better <laughs> opener than that, really? So um, the, the Stokely Secret, and also the Stokely Secret is very much set in my native county of Hampshire. So, and it really is a Hampshire. I mean, they are, they describe themselves as Hampshire hogs, as one does. Um, so that's high on my list. But um, I mean, there are so many others. It's hard. It's very hard, as you say, to choose your favourites. But yes, I mean, certainly Pillars is, is a masterpiece. And uh, really, it, it was just, it felt too good to be true that I kept reading more by her and I kept enjoying it. Um, I, I just thought this, this can't be. <laughs> um, so I'm very excited to continue because I've only read eight. Um, so I have quite a ways to go. Quite a way to go. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Um, I, I will say I did find online and I was delighted this like peachy pink copy of mm -hmm. Countess Kate. Um, ah, and I love this yeah. illustration. Oh, yeah. Beautiful Gwen Ravarat beautiful. illustrations. They're the, grand, they're yes. the Gwen Ravarat but, ones, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely convey the, the, the gorgeous. period and the spirit yeah. of Kate gorgeous. and her yes. naughtiness and her imagination. It's a great book, Countess Kate. I really, I loved it. I, I was telling someone, I think that Countess Kate is kind of if Anne Shirley from Anne of Green Gables became a countess. Mm. <laughs> um. So then I would love to learn more from both of you about Charlotte Mary Young's life just a little bit, because I know nothing. And one thing I am interested in is how many siblings she had. And also, was there, did she herself have a disability or was there someone in her close circle that was disabled? Well, shall I start about the life and Julia yeah. can take over the disability angle? Um, yes. Uh, so there, there she is, born, we're in her bicentenary birth year, uh, so born in 1823, and it wasn't uh, till about seven years later that her only brother was born, Julian. Uh, so she was a virtually an only child mm. um, for, those, for those first years of education, which her parents really applied themselves 
Um, she was taught, first of all, by her mother, then her father took over for mathematics and Latin and so on. He taught her to write. He was quite a hard taskmaster, one, one, one imagines, though that didn't um, damp her uh, enthusiastic, loving admiration uh, uh, for him. Um, it's a tiny village outside Winchester. Um, the railways hadn't even come to Winchester in her childhood years, not till she was a teenager. Uh, and uh, one gets the impression that apart from the annual visit to her father's relations in, in Devon, which would, were taken, of course, in a, 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 a coach drawn by horses in the in the early days, that would that would have been the great event of the year. And there she had met uh, families of, of cousins because her father was from quite a large family. Uh, and so there are children of her own age and how she loved that plainly. Mm -hmm biographical fragment that she's she's left us describes what a joy it was to you know to to engage with other other children and she mm -hmm. described things they 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 did by the sea and in the various wow. houses where they were staying in and so she wrote herself stories or made up for herself stories about large families uh because she didn't have one herself and obviously julian was you know, was no company for the first two or three <laughs> Uh, so there, there she is making up stories about a family of little girls who who live in a, a house together, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, they that though that becomes her very first published book, because as an exercise for her French master, she translates it into French under wow. under his vision, and it's corrected, and you know, French is made all, all correct. Uh, and when money is wanted uh, for a, a school in the village, uh, it's deemed that this could be printed. It's good enough to be printed uh, and to be sold uh, to raise funds for the school. And wow. the, gosh, is that now 1839? Is that she's 16? Is that anyway about about then? Um, sorry, this is awful. Can't remember the actual date. So that's the very first thing that she ever actually published or had 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 printed. Um, and then she she says at one point, um, uh, I, I, uh, I must have written. I had to write. I needed yeah. to write. Um, uh, even, she said, even if I hadn't been allowed to publish because there was a family conclave. Um, not not about this little book because that was for a good cause and that was different. But when it became a question of really publishing with proper commercial publishers, you know, was it ladylike to write? Was it mm. appropriate money for writing? And it was decided, well, yes, as long as the money was devoted to good causes, you know, that was that was okay. Um, and her name needn't appear on the title page and so on. Um, but uh, uh, she was obviously a born writer. She would have had to have written, she says, even if she'd never, never published. And then when the Air Redcliffe in 1853 became such a terrific bestseller, um, you know, her, her, her name was made, her subsequent books say um, uh, by the author of the Air of Redcliffe on the, on the title page. And she really, really takes off because it's a book everyone's reading. Mm. And it has very strongly the influence of John Keeble, who was the other, apart from her father, the other great influence upon her life, the vicar of Hursley and Otterbourne, her, her village and the neighbouring village. And his imprint and his mode of thought um, pervades it, really, in a, in a very understated way. You, you don't, it's, 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 again, it's not that people, you know, stand around preaching, but the ideals by which Keeble thought um, uh, people ought to ought to live uh, are, are embodied by all the uh, in their different ways by all the characters in the the air of Redcliffe, especially the hero Guy Morville. Yes. Oh uh, yeah, I I really appreciate how um, it does feel so organic how faith is woven into the stories. It seems something that it's not just platitudes that they're saying. Mm. It's, how does it, how, how do you live with it? Mm. Um, she writes it really beautifully. Uh, and then Julia, uh, what about the disability factor that's in so many of her novels? Well, that's fascinating. Um, Charlotte herself um, seems to me, and I think others too, to actually been extremely strong and healthy. 
she was uh, able to she as far as we can tell from the letters she never had uh, didn't have a, a really serious period of illness during her adult life and as a child she seems only to have had you know the normal childhood illnesses um she wasn't uh she wasn't sort of um at very sporty in well I mean you couldn't be really very sporty in the 1840s anyway <laughs> but I mean she wasn't for instance a horsewoman because mm -hmm. she was she always said that she was physically clumsy and rather physically timid but she could walk for miles and miles and miles um, both in Devon and, and in Hampshire and um she was able to write three books at the same time, moving from table to table and teach at the Sunday school and entertain visitors wow. and go on visits all over, um, you know, the south of England. So she certainly seems to have had quite a, um, a good sort of healthy um, physique, shall we say. Mm. So I, I don't think the disability came from her own experience, but mm. she did take into her home um, uh, and this was later in life, after her brother had married, uh, I think it was a sister-in-law called Gertrude. And this lady was actually Gertrude Walter. She was disabled. We're not quite sure what her problem was, but she certainly could not move well. She didn't have full mobility at that time, possibly some form of arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis mm. um, and some sort of health problems. And although um, Charlotte had said, particularly during her mother's long years of decline, that she was not personally suited to nursing, she did actually provide a really caring and supportive home for Gertrude, as, as appears from the letters and from other people's accounts. But she does have, as you've said, she's got this wonderful appreciation of, you know, how disabled people can actually add to, well, have very rich full lives. And if you want to know about disability in the 19th century novel, may I put in a plug for our co-editor, Claire Walker-Gore, who wrote this Plotting Disability in the 19th Century Novel by Claire Walker-Gore. And it does have a large section on Young, as well as some other fantastic authors, such as Wilkie Collins. Oh. And I can really, you know, if you can get hold of this, it's really well worth it. Um, but certainly, as Claire and, and many others have shown, in fact, the um, most people in Charlotte Young's novels have, you, as you might say, a period of disability at some point, whether it's um, uh, difficult pregnancy, whether it's pretty well um, postnatal depression, whether it's being wounded in a war, whether it's having an accident. Now, some people have pretty well a lifelong disability, like Charles Edmonston. Others have te more temporary disabilities. I think the idea is that partly that those who are disabled can contribute and can have full lives. And also um, for the, the strong and healthy, a period of weakness and disability can actually provide a space for spiritual and emotional and personal growth, both for the person who is in that situation and those who are caring for him or her. Yes. Oh, thank you for bringing up that book. And I will make sure to link uh, link to it in the description because it does sound like it would be just full of interesting uh, kind of observations on, mm -hmm. on how disability is portrayed. And I just, I feel like she seems that she was full of empathy, you know, if she had this yes. sister-in-law yeah. um, and that she didn't consider it a, uh, a character weakness. No, uh, not at know. all. Not at all. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Fact, I just, I'm yeah. sorry. Sorry. Um, I was going to say more character building, but having said that, um, she is very much somebody who doesn't regard the invalid as a cousin Helen, as a, 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 a saintly invalid in the, in the house. Invalids can be petulant, they can be fretful, yeah. they can rail against their suffering. Um, so it's not an idealization of suffering and disability. It's quite yeah. of quite sharp eyed, really. It is. Yeah, I think it shows kind of uh, the challenges, I, I think maybe, yeah, in the air of Redcliffe with accessibility sometimes mm -hmm. when Charles can't can't do certain things, 
Um, but it's not, that doesn't make up the whole of him. Um, and yeah, it's, it's quite remarkable how she portrays that. And also in, um, the three brides, I think it's Julian that is albino. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he is. Um, uh, and that is just like seamlessly introduced the fact that he's so yeah. short. Yeah, yeah. But of course, the, the awful invalid in that is the horrible mother, isn't it? Julia Charnock Poinsett, who is straight out of Ivy Compton Burnett, that one. My goodness. <laughs> I mean, she doesn't let any kind of disability get in her way of dominating her world. No, she does not. That that one. Um. That one is actually, it's way up there for me. Mm. I really enjoyed The Three Brides. Um, and again, with, at first it starts out and I'm, you know, who, which character is who, you're getting all the names and then their personalities come alive and you don't have trouble distinguishing between them. Uh, so then it was interesting in, in the email when we were chatting back and forth and planning, uh, one of you pointed out Charlotte Mary Young's avoidance of the marriage plot and how she does more family chronicles. And it hadn't ever occurred to me. Um, and that's something that I really relish about her books is sometimes, you know, when the happily ever after happens, I think, oh, but I wonder what their lives were like after that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and sometimes it's not so happily ever after, but I just really appreciate that. So I guess, Clemens, what are your, your thoughts on how, how she does this and how it's executed? Yeah, well, the Family Chronicles, we've, we've really hardly mentioned how characters from many of the earlier books are carried on through, uh, remember, she has a 50-year almost career of writing. Uh, some of the characters uh, who were first met in the books of the, what, the eight, late 1840s, 1850s, reoccur in the very last book of 1900. So really? she, mm. picked them, she picks them up more or less in the uh, 60s, 70s or thereabouts. There are freestanding books that have no links with, with other novels, but um, a whole sequence of novels brings in the same characters. Um, for, for example, the, the children in scenes and characters reappear in the 70s or so as grown up mothers with their, with their own families and so on. And they're the, recognizably the same people. Um, wow. Now they're, you know, they're, they're either married or not married or they have families or whatever. And we see them making um, decisions rather similar to the ones they perhaps made or they developed out of the child teenager that they were all that's very fascinating about her family chronicle aspect so of course in other words marriages occur all over the place as they're bound to do if you're going to be covering families who you know who run on for 50 years or so but it's not often the resolution of the plot it's not often where, where they, you know, they, they're all, you know, it's all tied up and it's going to be happy ever after. Some novels importantly begin with a marriage or The Three Brides begins with three marriages or Heartsease Ease begins with the marriage of this um, naive 16 year old introduced to a social circle that she, she's never encountered before. And so we see the, the developments that, you know, the married state uh, brings uh, upon, you know, uh, both the participants themselves and their, their, their fuller wider families. Um, uh, in others, um, there is some kind of a, a, a goal to be addressed or achieved. And mm. the, that is, is the more important thing. For example, in the daisy chain, um, uh, at the very outset, um, the mother, who is obviously the wonderful guardian angel of the family, dies in a carriage accident. Uh, and um, the subtitle of the daisy chain is Aspirations. Mm -hmm. They all have their various different aspirations, which they fulfill or don't fulfill uh, in, the, in the course of the novel. And Ethel, the heroine that we, we mentioned earlier, clever, uh, gawky Ethel, um, she decides that uh, on, on, on that day, they'd been going to visit a very poor hamlet where the people are uh, unspeakably deprived um, to bring to this little hamlet called Coxmoor. And it starts by bringing a school to Coxmoor because you've got to educate people a bit and sort of you know, prepare them for um, uh, bringing the church. And this, that is the, um, the backbone, as it were, of the novel. 
uh, Ethel, Ethel uh, achieves this by the very end, not only due to herself, though she's put in all her efforts into, into teaching and you know, saving money towards it, but we see the participation of family and friends um, who uh, watch or advise or, or um, contribute. Um, a, a, a timely legacy comes from somebody who uh, admires the way Ethel's been sticking to this. Uh, and so the, um, the culmination of the novel is the dedication of the church. And coincidentally with it, yes, one of the brothers gets married and goes off to be a missionary in New Zealand. Uh, but, you know, his marriage isn't what the, the book is focusing towards. Mm -hmm. Focusing to, you know, it's, its focus is on how they've all um, achieved or not achieved their aspirations. And one of those is, one of the very important things in Young is the not achieving or circumstances making things different. Because Norman, who ultimately will become a missionary, um, had seemed set for a, a career in either actual politics, you know, um, uh, political politics, as it were, uh, a kind of trollop person, or church politics, uh, a church controversialist, uh, because he is so brilliant, he is so good at arguing, he is so good at, at putting things over and convincing people. And this, of course, is his great temptation. And he realizes that that's not what he ought to be doing. It's, you know, it's the, it's the wrong way of applying his talents. And he'll go off to New Zealand instead and, and, and become a missionary. So aspirations change or, um, or, or, or grow or are sometimes thwarted, of course, often they're, they're thwarted. Young's quite good on thwarting. <laughs> um, quite a lot of people, you know, find they cannot do what they'd, what they'd hoped to do. Sometimes, as we said um, before, through disability. In other cases, as Charles Edmonston, um, you know, they, they actually become a more useful person, having over, overcome um, the various thwartings that had beset them in 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 youth. Um, so uh, I, I think that uh, you know there is so much else going on that it avoids uh, too much focus on. Certainly, there's not much sex in in young, but even even love. You know, there's 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 marriage, and there is certainly there is love, but romance is not. It's you know they're not any of them. I would say you know a, a ro romances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that I really uh, appreciate about her books as well, how you talked about there, you know, if there isn't a disability, then sometimes there's an, a, some sort of obstacle that mm. is put in their way. And I think um, as a reader, those are the most moving kinds of books to me is life is very unfair. And so when you're reading about characters that are struggling with unfair circumstances, I think it's really consoling. Um to be, to be, uh, have a kind of a, a safe, you know, this is not your life, but you can read about it um, and kind of take comfort in that. Uh, so Julia, did you have anything you'd like to add? Not really. I mean, I think Clements has, uh, again, has really put it so well. I think partly too, um, uh, Young herself never married, as we know. Um, so the books are to an extent valid. I mean, there are validations of single women. And when you think of some of the, really sort of um, rather rather cynical and unpleasant things that were said about unmarried women, particularly during th those years, mm -hmm. about spinsters and blue stockings and surplus women and um, old maids and all of that. And I mean, we have so many characters in Young who actually really give the lie to that because they are single women and single men also. I mean, there's a certain amount of clerical celibacy here. Hardly, I mean, hard to achieve in some cases. But um, so there are single people of both genders who, um, and I have to say, in some cases, um, you say, well, there isn't much sex in Young. Perhaps you have to dig fairly deep for the sex, but there's a certain amount of same-sex attraction, perhaps, that goes on oh. in, in, in some of the novels. Um, so I think there is that validation of a life that is not actually um, uh, having marriage as its high point. And I also very much endorse the point that um, very often we see a marriage working out, not always happily all the time, mm -hmm. um, but the sheer hard work that has to go in making a successful marriage. 
and the compromises and the balances, like even between Mr. and Mrs. Edmonstone, um, that have to be made, the constant adjustments to the other partner. I think, although, I mean, considering that Young herself was a single woman, she had this great observation that she could see. And sometimes I think, sometimes she would observe and perhaps not fully understand quite what was going on, but she reported it so sensitively that the reader can pick up what is happening. Don't know if that makes sense. Yes, yes, it does, it does. She's very skilled at, at doing that. Mm. Um, so then if we could talk briefly about, uh, you mentioned the role of the natural world in her novels, um, which I feel that her, her character sometimes this might not be accurate, but feel a bit transcendentalist in that they kind of discover more of themselves when they're out relishing beauty out in the natural world. Um, so what kind of role were you thinking it plays? I guess, Clemens? Well, Julia is really the expert on this, but I'll just say a preliminary thing or two. Um, something that we know Young felt through her own experience, or uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure we, we've seen it in the letters, but she puts it into the mouth of one of her uh, heroines, um, which is a middle-aged heroine, by the way. The woman in Hopes and Fears, Honora, is, uh, well, we see her starting at the age of about 20, but really she's about 40 when things begin happening. And that's relatively unusual to have an unmarried heroine mm. of her age. And she says something along the lines of, um, one finds that these things, the study of nature, um, you know, are, are, you know, really can, you know, uh, they're, they're engaging and consoling when things are not going well. And I'm, I'm sure that somewhere in, in the letters, Young, Young gives a, a, a similar expression that, you know, even if, even if life's not, you know, not going absolutely wonderfully, that just to admire, she'd see this very much in a Keeble, Keebelian sense of uh, admiring and uh, gaining greater understanding too of the works of the creator is an important aspect of you know man mankind humans uh, finding their place on on earth that there is you know so much that's remarkable and wonderful in, in to engage with in creation mm, thank you and then julia what are some of your observations you have about this well, exactly as Clements has said, I mean, certainly if you take the work of Keeble and um, other Tractarian writers, I mean, writers who take the same religious stance, really um, the works of the creator are a way of approaching the creator. And she doesn't see nature in a Darwinian sense as permanent struggle, nor does she see it in the sense of something which should be exploited for human gain. Um, we, see, we see the divine through the natural world and we go closer to the divine through it. Um, you need to have some sort of right-minded way of looking. Not everyone can actually relate to nature in this way. For instance, in Dinaba Terrace, um, I, uh, the young, the heroine, the rather stolid heroine, takes the same journey to South America, but uh, so she sees the same natural phenomena on her journey, on the two journeys, but she sees them differently the second time because her appreciation of the divine nature of the world has been heightened by her association with the man she eventually marries. Um, so I think there's that. I think there's also the fact that certainly um, at the time, um, the study of botany, gardening and natural history was very much available to women in a way that some scientific pursuits were not. It was seen as perfectly acceptable for women. I and mean, we've got so many examples of, you know, women who studied seaweeds, who planted gardens, who um, uh, painted flowers like Marian North, all of those people, women particularly, who engaged with the natural world in, in, in ways which were absolutely acceptable. Nobody said, because you're a woman, you can't become an expert on seaweeds. Now, there's some things you're not allowed to be an expert on, but seaweeds are fine. So I think we've got that um, certainly she was able to enjoy, and her heroines, and well, the 
the male characters too, do really enjoy what she described as botanizing. I mean, go, walking around and looking in. I mean, this is something that she did in her own home village and recorded, a bit like Gilbert White in Selborne. She recorded month by month what was happening in the natural world and how, for mm. instance, the orchids in the area were becoming less frequently seen because of the building of a whole lot of new housing developments. Mm. So she noted that um, and she certainly noted the problems which were brought, brought by industrialization into country life. Oh, this is also interesting to think about. And um, that's, I, I always kind of, I always enjoy when characters and novels have hobbies. Something about it I think is very mm -hmm. endearing, just following their hobbies and their interests. Um, so then lastly, Clements, would you be willing to just briefly, uh, I know that you've done some work with kind of Greek myths and that the way it influenced some of Charlotte Mary Young's works, kind of how did that connect with her novels? Well, she was very well read in classical uh, literature um, uh, and um, she uses uh, on a couple of occasions, a couple of novels are completely patterned on a Greek myth. Um, one is um, Love and Life, which uses the Cupid and Psyche story and sets it in the, in the reign of um, George I, uh, which enables her to have um, her heroine, who is called Aurelia, who is, of course, the Psyche character, um, kidnapped and undergo all sorts of various ordeals that wow. she allow uh, certainly she we, she would never have contemplated letting a contemporary <laughs> lady undergo but the 18th century apart from being the um story of her great hero scott i mean his novels being set there she just loved scott's novels so the 18th oh. century is just both close enough and yet distanced enough to let this kind of thing uh, go on and have the you know have duels and abductions and all all kinds of exciting things like that um, but the, the most remarkable one, I think, is My Young Alcides, which takes the story of, of Heracles, Hercules, Heracles, uh, and, his, <clears throat> and his 12 labours, and puts them into uh, circa 1850. Uh, uh, and um, uh, all the labours, overcoming the lion, um, uh, uh, hunting the um, Caledonian boar, no, sorry, yes, it's Caledonian yes. Right, um, uh, all of all of those are made into perfectly integrated, lifelike episodes. Where Heracles is a young man from Australia, come back uh, to to be the um, uh, as it seems at first the heir, but then it turns out the next but one heir to an estate in 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 England, um, and uh, we see both his uh, labours. Of this, of this physical kind, helping his uh, cousin, who is in fact the heir, to um, uh, bring this uh, uh, estate uh, back into you know, good, uh, well, good management, good cultivation. But we also see it's an important spiritual journey that he's undergoing. Um, his early life experiences have made him virtually a heathen, and so we see through the eyes of a. Um, a rather naive um, uh, or unreliable narrator, uh, we, we see glimpses of how he is being changed spiritually to become uh, a, a, a believer and a full Christian uh, in, uh, in, the, in the course of this uh, couple of years of, of narrated life. And again, that's very typical of Young in that she doesn't give us his own thoughts, his own internal, you know, wrestlings, his doubts, or his, you know, his um, uh, uh, steps towards belief. We, we see them just in the odd glimpse that this, the, the narrator Lucy sees of them. Uh, young, like Keeble, like all the Tractarians, is a great believer in reserve, that you don't pry into uh, people's, real people's, or even characters' internal feelings too much. You, you know, you, you can read clues, but you don't obtrude or, and you don't intrude, you don't ob or intrude into, into what they're 
uh, uh, doing all thinking. And, and so this, this spiritual journey is very deftly told through, you know, Lucy getting, you know, a sort of idea, a glimpse uh, of this or that insight into, into how Harold, who is Hercules, is, is progressing. And then in the end, he dies, of course, because obviously there's got to be apotheosis at the end. Yes. Wow. That is, it's really interesting too, because there's actually a children's book that was released earlier this year called The Labors of Hercules Beale. And it's set in modern day society. And it's a, I think he's a 12 year old boy living on um, Cape Cod. And his teacher gives him him an assignment where he has to, throughout the course of the year, find uh, analogies in his own life to the 12 labors. Um, So I love how uh, endlessly relatable aspects of the Greek myths Uh, can be. Uh, So now I just have so many other new Charlotte Mary Young titles to to investigate. Um, So would you say those are some of the more uncharacteristic of her books? Because I heard, you know, someone traveling to South America and, and then that Heracles retelling. Yes. Uh, If you, sorry, if you mean the classical ones, those, those were, um, you know, Un- unusual in her in her oeuvre. and one of the interesting things is that um, people seem uh, well certainly in the case of love and life they seem hardly she hardly expected them, no not she hardly expected them she did expect them and then found by the time she writes the second edition and has to write a new preface to it she finds they didn't realize they didn't grasp they didn't see the originating plot they weren't aware of it um, which, you know, we're considering how classically educated most people, you know, yeah. men were, and mm. by, as it were, by osmosis, you know, and retellings and so on, you know, girls, women were too, uh, is, you know, is, is, is very, very surprising. Um, yes. Uh, but you know, there's a fair bit about the classics in, in her, uh, the journal that she edited for many, many years, the monthly packet that has classical stuff in it. You know, it's, uh, it is part of the sort of, you know, back intellectual background of, of most of them. But then, you know, you get this odd surprise, like, oops, but in this case, they didn't see it. <laughs> well, that is so funny that I, I mean, I, it would be frustrating, though, as an author, if you, here's your intent. Um, and it was just kind of, people didn't grasp onto it. (laughs) Well, this has been so enriching and I want to thank you both for taking the time to speak with me about this. Well, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity. It's been a wonderful opportunity. May we take advantage of the opportunity to to advertise our our own book co-edited with- (laughs) Please. Oops, I'm holding it the wrong way, there we are. Um, the, the yeah. Claire, who we mentioned earlier as writing on disability and uh, our, ourselves co-edited this in time for the uh, bicentenary, uh, 16 chapters on every aspect you could think about of Charlotte Young writing oh. her, for, for, for her 50 year career. Wow. Oh, that sounds so interesting. Thank you for mentioning it. And I will make sure to link that as well down below. So thank you, you, uh, everyone, if you're watching this back later, and I hope that you enjoyed it and have a lovely day.